Welcome to this exclusive Asia Briefing vlog. My name is Gary Shaven, and I'll be your host. Throughout 2022, we're featuring our partner and parent company, Dizan Sheeran Associates, as they celebrate their 30th anniversary. Each month, we'll speak to an equity partner, expert, or guest as they recount the firm's history to present day story and on the ground issues that companies face in today's thriving and rapidly developing Asia. In this clip, we're joined by managing partner, Mr. Alberto Vetteretti, who takes us through the company's foray some five, seven years ago into the ASEAN region. We're also rejoined by head of ASEAN International Business Advisory, Marco Forster. Marco explains some of the differences between ASEAN countries, uh, some of the, the key sectors and game-changing developments that are happening there, and, and really what the opportunities are. Uh, are for international business. Let's jump in. Hi, Alberto. Uh, welcome back and thank you for joining today to discuss Dizan Sheeran Associates' past and ongoing expansion throughout the ASEAN region. Uh, as a recap, Dizan Sheeran established itself uh, first in China in 1992, then entered Vietnam, India, and Singapore over the next 15 years. Its broader entry into the ASEAN region came about in the last seven plus years can, what can you tell us about what propelled Design Share to pursue a broader ASEAN strategy? Uh, thank you for having me back, uh, Gary. Um, ASEAN has always been on the firm's uh, radar screen for, for many years. I remember um, in the old days when we were just working out of China, uh, the big things about uh, ASEAN were uh, how do I mitigate my labor cost or how do I find more labor? as uh, uh, the offer in China was uh, was actually shrinking. So we've been monitoring ASEAN for, for quite a while. We've seen the ups and downs. Um, I remember back in 97, the Asian financial crisis and then uh, the global financial meltdown in 2008. So all this um, uh, happenings have uh, really shaped up the way um, ASEAN is right now. But if there is one thing in particular I remember about ASEAN, um, FDIs have always been um, um, attracted to this part of the world. And I think now ASEAN counts in between 15 and 20 percent of um, uh, the global uh, FDI stock. So uh, this is only going to grow in, uh, in the years ahead. And um, ASEAN has actually overtook China in terms of attractiveness uh, towards FDIs. Uh, besides FDIs, uh, is the fifth largest country if you consider ASEAN as, as a country on its own right. He has the same GDP as uh, Germany. So that is uh, a trigger point for us to be in, uh, in this location. Um, population wise, close to 700 million people, young uh, demographics, 65% uh, of the population is under 35 years of age. Uh, not that just young, but very, very digitally savvy. So uh, think about all those brands and consumers uh, tapping into this uh, potentially huge market. So that's also very attractive for, for FDIs. Um, in the recent years, uh, also we've seen the free, you know, all the discussions about the free trade agreements involving ASEAN or some of the countries in ASEAN. And I refer to uh, RCEP, um, which took effect on 1st of January 2022, but also the CPTPP, uh, who started in, uh, in 2019. So all this is evolving, but uh, nevertheless, it contributes to ASEAN uh, attractiveness. So all in all, I would say a very good solid base in most ASEAN countries, uh, particularly ASEAN 6. Um, recently, the governments have been doing quite well in containing uh, COVID and opening up their economies as well. Uh, inflation is a big concern, but uh, most of the economies have been very good at keeping this below uh, 5%. So really uh, find a good balance in between um, uh, pushing their exports, but also making sure the internal demand is there. And it's no wonder that for the first time, ASEAN is actually growing faster than China. So uh, another angle to look at this from is uh, now that the, the firm entered and expanded into ASEAN, um, by the way, uh, via Greenfield Investments, as well as partnering with other firms, um, why was this different approach selected for that region and how has the strategy fared uh, in the past five years since? 
Right. Um, it's a big turf to, to cover. And um, uh, I think so far we picked the right winner within within ASEAN. Uh, we established operations in Vietnam, in uh, Singapore and Indonesia, as we discussed uh, before. Uh, and in a way, COVID slowed this, uh, this down. Uh, we've essentially been stuck for the past two to three years. And uh, we would perhaps already have our own operations in, uh, um, in the other ASEAN six countries had uh, COVID not impacted so much uh, the economy of these countries. Having said that, we uh, obviously cannot grow so much organically. And uh, we had to develop... Um, really a network of likely-minded professional firms in Thailand, Philippines, and uh, Malaysia. So we embarked on this journey to, to find um, firms which share the same values as our firm in terms of quality, uh, in terms of um, being approachable, in terms of uh, client mix, uh, in terms of value that they share. So uh, we have lined up a few firms and uh, interviewed them and worked with them over multiple projects, uh, depending on their capabilities, depending on uh, which areas of expertise they were feeling more comfortable with. And over the years, we, um, we've actually um, uh, lined up quite a few good players. And uh, with some of them, we have a very, very strong uh, relationship. And um, who knows what will happen in the future? Perhaps uh, we will uh, be even closer to them in terms of uh, forming joint ventures or perhaps even as we are closer to each other, uh, do something more, including mergers or acquisitions. Well, that's interesting. So with a with a really strong base then in the region and these uh, economies uh, on, the, on the really fast rebound, um, bringing us forward then looking uh, a little bit into the crystal ball, uh, where does the firm see its stake into the ASEAN region heading, let's say, over the next few years? When we look at uh, ASEAN uh, projections, it's very difficult to uh, look at the crystal ball. But what we are sure about is really the expansion in terms of uh, population. Uh, ASEAN will hit the 800 million uh, people uh, very soon by 2030. And, and it's not just population. It's about um, uh, GDP growth. Um, the projections by 2030 uh, put ASEAN, I think, on number fifth in terms of the largest country at 6.6 .6 trillion US dollars. And also in terms of trading, um, 4.5 trillion US dollars puts ASEAN really at the fourth uh, place in terms of uh, um, uh, order of uh, GDP. Free trade agreements will surely help uh, ASEAN to reach all these uh, ambitious goals. And um, one of the good things I like about ASEAN is the fact that uh, all the countries are not really dependent on one single country as top export or import destinations. So there is lots of inter-ASEAN uh, trading uh, going on, but the fact they are not reliant on one single importing countries or exporting uh, destinations make really ASEAN 6 quite strong in, uh, in that regard. Of course, uh, emerging uh, Asia and uh, ASEAN will, will lead the way. We see the economic uh, dynamo having moved to, uh, to Asia and uh, uh, ASEAN will get uh, um, stronger in, in the year ahead. Of course, uh, it's not just uh, plain sailing all the way. Um, there will be productivity issues. There will be potential public debt issues from some of the countries how to mitigate the, the, the carbon intensive manufacturing footprint that they are developing culture as well. Um, ASEAN is so diverse, but I think this is also what makes ASEAN so exciting. I'd like to uh, thank you very much, Alberto. It was uh, great to have you back. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us and welcome back. Uh, what, to jump straight in here, how are key ASEAN countries currently poised for growth and for international business? Uh, in terms of their openness, uh, ease of business, barriers, and their carried momentum into the coming year. Okay, um, Gary, thanks for having me again. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, they're definitely poised for growth and um, there's definitely momentum, but just to, to tap a little bit of, um, on where that's coming from, I think the big headline at, at the end of sep September was that the Asian Development Bank, the ADB, announced um, that in the first time of, um, in 30 years, Asia's developing economies grew faster than China's. So developing Asia, excluding China, um, is set to grow by 5.3%, 5 
in 2022 this year and uh, China only by 3.3 percent. So you can really see this golden window opening up for ASEAN right now, um, for some countries more than for others, of course, because ASEAN is simply one of the most diverse regional um, political associations in the world. If you just look at um, in terms of forms of government, uh, ethnic backgrounds, the languages are very diverse, uh, nearly different religions everywhere. And of course, uh, economic standing and, and outlooks are very different as well. Um, but overall, ASEAN um, is on the right trajectory. Um, ASEAN as a whole is, is really tightly woven into the global net of free trade agreements, which also, of course, boost FDI and boost international trade. If you look at um, FTAs directly between ASEAN and other countries, you can already count in Australia, New Zealand, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, and, and India. So really all the big economies in, in Asia Pacific. And uh, on top of that, there are plenty of other bilateral free trade agreements, for example, um, between Singapore and the US. Uh, Singapore also has one with the UK and also one with the GCC, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council in the Middle East. And what makes Vietnam and Singapore special in ASEAN is, is that they have this direct FTA with the European Union uh, as well, which um, is uh, quite, uh, yeah, giving giving these two countries quite some, some benefits in terms of uh, EU FDI influx. And um, all of the 10 um, member states are also part of uh, regional uh, uh, agreements, such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, and then there's also the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, quite a mouthful, um, but uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam are part of uh, the CPTPP. And um, these FTAs do make a difference in these days, so um, that will bring that momentum we talked about. And of course, FTAs aren't everything. And without going into too much detail right now, but you have a lot of these supply chain diversification uh, going on in the background. Foreign companies in China, but also plenty of Chinese firms are looking for outside locations. And also um, European companies that didn't even think of offshoring before the gas and electricity price hikes in Europe are now looking towards uh, manufacturing in ASEAN instead of in Europe. So overall, for many, it seems to be the right location um, and the right investment destination right now. Yes, certainly. So um, looking um, perhaps at some of the top five countries in ASEAN um, as emergent economies, which are some of the notable or perhaps game-changing sectors and developments that you've seen are underway? Um, I know five is a nice number, but um, uh, internally we often talk about uh, the six big ASEAN economies because number five and uh, number six, if you if you rank the economies, Vietnam and the Philippines are, aren't too far apart and, and also grow similarly. But really after the six, there's this really big drop in economic size or, or GDP. Um, but the top six in order by nominal GDP are Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So if we look at each of them, Indonesia is really uh, the giant of ASEAN. We talked about it in a previous episode. Um, Indonesia's GDP is larger than that of Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam combined. And uh, it is also the fourth most um, populous country in the world, um, just after um, China, India, and the US. So if you're looking to tap a single domestic market with uh, a fast-growing middle class, um, if you're looking for something beyond China, the US and India and, and the European Union, I think Indonesia would be your safest bet. Um, a lot of the potential for infrastructure investment is there in general, um, of course, uh, but Indonesia has also decided to um, build a new capital city, Nusantara, uh, which opens up just a, a wide range of public tenders, which FDI can take part in uh, as well. And uh, also next month, the G20 will be hosted in, in Bali by Indonesian President Jokowi. Um, he, by the way, also invited um, both Zelensky and Putin to the G20. So um, but you can see a little bit his ambitions for Indonesia and ASEAN as a more neutral uh, player in, in the global politics um, beyond the China-influenced sphere, uh, the US or, or Europe. Um, and uh, so... There are these many spotlights that are shining on Indonesia right now. 
Thailand um, is probably the country most foreign investors are familiar with, uh, just giving their standing as, as a tourism magnet. So I'm not saying because they invested there, probably they traveled there before. And 2019, um, Bangkok was the most visited city in the world. Um, its growth projection isn't as promising uh, as some of the neighbors, but they also come from a more solid base. Uh, many investors here um, have something already set up. It's an interesting country for the Asian automotive supply chain, for example. Many vehicle manufacturers uh, and their suppliers are based here. Um, a Honda motorbike I bought in Germany, uh, for example, was a Honda that was built in Thailand. So uh, you have all the big players there. So Malaysia would be the next country here, which is uh, recently in the headlines um, for probably all the wrong reasons, given their political instability and uh, repeated uh, general elections. However, what's interesting about Malaysia is that the businesses and the economy seem to be rather and, and comparatively unaffected by, by this political instability. In the ease of doing business index, Malaysia ranks 12 out of 190 countries. That says... Uh, a ton about how straightforward it is to do business in, in Malaysia. And uh, Malaysia really keeps attracting FDI um, that want to find also a regional hub in APEC other than Singapore or Hong Kong. And um, there's not really too much uh, need to talk about Singapore. It's dethroning um, Hong Kong as Asia's financial center right now. It's being on spot two of the ease of doing business index, which we just talked about. Uh, and uh, Singapore is not only attracting uh, multinationals to become its APEC headquarter location, but also global headquarter location. Um, you probably know uh, Dyson, uh, the British company with a fancy uh, vacuum cleaners and so on. They a few years ago made the move uh, from the UK to Singapore for their global headquarter location um, because of Brexit, of course, uh, but also because of uh, FTA that Singapore directly has with the European Union and uh, quote unquote, lower manufacturing costs and greater access to the growing Asian markets. So you see where the momentum is going again. They didn't go for Singapore just for Singapore, but for the region. Um, Vietnam would be the fifth uh, largest ASEAN economy. And Vietnam has really been uh, the country everyone is talking about in 2022. Everyone is running to in 2022. And uh, we at DSA ourselves even receive huge interest in business intelligence services for Vietnam, uh, setting up companies here. Um, we also made a separate episode about Vietnam with our country manager, Filippo. Um, so I encourage, encourage the audience to watch that. Um, lastly, the Philippines is also slowly moving out of a typical BPO and call center economy to attract uh, more manufacturing, which is interesting. In, in North Luzon Island, they have nice industry parks there. Some companies are considering that. And Vietnam and the Philippines are also the fastest growing economies in ASEAN. That's fascinating. I actually learned quite a few points from uh, from what you just shared there. Uh, so uh, comparing some of these countries um, with entering a larger market like China or India for an international business, what is unique about entering into an ASEAN country and what do firms need to think about differently? That's a very interesting question. And um, one thing I mentioned earlier is that if you're looking to to tap a single market um, with a big consumer base, other than China and India, that would probably be Indonesia. Um, ASEAN isn't as straightforward as doing business in the European Union. Um, however, it's being made simpler through um, RCEP and other regional uh, agreements. However, there's no complete freedom of movement if you're a foreign resident in, in one of the ASEAN countries, for example. So you really need to make sure you enter the right ASEAN destination uh, before you set up a company there. And uh, the re regulatory requirements are, are different uh, in, in all of these countries. Um, so that's... Uh, that's huge difference in, in terms of how open, how liberal uh, an economy is, um, what the minimum capital requirements are for setting up a foreign owned company in some of the countries. If there even are some in Vietnam, for example, they're very uh, open right now. Um, some countries in ASEAN also do have a quota on how many foreigners they're allowed to hire directly under their company uh, and, and the quota on uh, per each 
uh, foreign uh, employee in, in under the company, there need to be three, four, five local employees. So um, there, there are some ways to to circumvent that through JVs and and through uh, finding uh, a local partner that opens the company on your behalf. But generally, if you want to keep the control uh, of your foreign invested entity, you need to make sure that you can uh, do all of these things uh, in the country. Uh, some countries have positive lists, some countries have negative investment lists. So you need to make sure whether uh, your business line or the, uh, in your industry or sector, there need to be special licensing procedures uh, being done in the country. So generally, from what I've experienced uh, working uh, with many leads and, and companies that invested in ASEAN, I would think that Vietnam would be the second most popular destination after Singapore in, in the last two, three years, just because of the openness of the economy. And something that um, is often underestimated uh, when making these investment decisions is if that one foreign employee or expert actually wants to live in that country. So you need to make sure that um, it's a immigration friendly uh, country. It's not very difficult to get an employment pass or work permit. So there are some countries again that are very open towards that. For example, Malaysia, they have a they have a very nice scheme which is called Malaysia My Second Home, where you just have to prove that you have certain assets on a bank account and uh, are eligible for a ten year um, uh, visa. And they encourage you to not only take your kids and spouse there, but also the grandparents. So these are some of the things that are very different from from other ASEAN countries. Again, so um, overall the right place to be, but you need to make sure which country to to set up in, and that's why. One my last point, um, business intelligence services uh, under our company are really being sold a lot in Southeast Asia, because if you enter China and you have one company in China, you can tap the Chinese market. Same for India. But if you want to tap ASEAN, you really need to learn about the different regulatory requirements, different economies, um, do competitor analysis, product analysis uh, on the ground. So that's where I, th I think people still need to learn a lot uh, about ASEAN. It's not as straightforward because it's not a single entity. So speaking about business intelligence, this is a great segue actually into uh, the, the last question for today. Um, can you share a little bit about Desan Shira's ASEAN presence and capabilities and how companies and people might get in touch with uh, the teams there? Yes, uh, definitely. So um, our business intelligence team is is based uh, throughout the region. Um, we have that a little bit here in Ho Chi Minh City, where we have a head of our business intelligence uh, team sitting here. Um, also, I'm sitting here. We're traveling extensively, but um, we we cover the whole region from from our different locations um, through either Asian Alliance Partners, which is, uh, a, an alliance that we, um, have throughout all of Asia, but also our in-house offices. So, um, when we look at our, at our largest, uh, operations in, in Southeast Asia, we're looking at Ho Chi Minh City, uh, with the largest office, but in Vietnam, we've been expanding rapidly with a growing demand, um, in, in the past two, three years have an office in Hanoi as well, in Da Nang, even eyeing at a fourth office in Haiphong, a Northern industrial hub where uh, automotive and semiconductor uh, companies are settling at the moment. Um, in Indonesia is also one of the faster growing um, markets for us, um, where we have an office in Jakarta um, with Jennifer Harlem there, which is easy to find on, on LinkedIn, and you can also easily contact her that is uh, handling inquiries for um, all, all of Indonesia, basically. And uh, we also have an office in Batam, an Indonesian island that is just 20 minutes by ferry from Singapore. Um, and in Singapore ourselves, uh, we also have uh, David sitting, who runs our Singapore office. David Stepat, also very active on LinkedIn. Perhaps you've already uh, seen his name somewhere. Um, he's helping a lot of the companies that are currently looking to um, shift their uh, APEC HQs from Hong Kong to Singapore. That's, so that's interesting to see. Uh, but also uh, a lot of these European companies that are currently uh, looking at uh, an APEC hub. On the other hand, if you have questions uh, regarding multiple markets or any of the other markets that I just didn't mention, you can just get in touch with me. 
uh, and um, I'm working with with a regional team there as well. Uh, some are based in in Ho Chi Minh City, some in other locations that also cover the other markets. We have a regional alliance under Desenshira and Associates, um, the Desenshira Asian Alliance, where we onboarded trusted partners in Manila, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, that can help with all of the services that we offer in our in-house locations as well. And um, I, I'd also be happy to liaise uh, with our business intelligence team um, who can also cover the whole region and, and even beyond. Oh, well, thank you. Without, without a doubt, one of the uh, comments that I hear most often when companies are speaking about Design Shira is, is really about their presence. And it's quite remarkable. Um, if I heard you correctly, um, ASEAN is Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia. Did I miss anything? Um, and then plus with this alliance extension throughout other countries in, in Asia, uh, yeah. As well as, of course, its uh, its longtime presences in uh, China, Hong Kong, and India. Sounds great. Thank you very, very much for joining us today, Marco. Um, it was extremely educational. I, I hope you might be willing to uh, to rejoin us again in the future. Um, thank you. Thanks, Gary.